In this presentation, we will look at different doctrines and principles as found in 1 Corinthians chapters 14 through 16. So let's begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 6, the gift of prophecy. Although some people might assume that the gift of prophecy is reserved only for church leaders, many scriptures teach that the gift is available to all faithful followers of Christ, including both men and women. See Numbers 11, 24 through 29 and 1 Nephi 10, 17 through 19. President Down H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained the difference between the gift of prophecy and the prophetic office. He quotes, The nouns prophecy and prophet and their variations, such as the adjective prophetic and the verb prophecy, are used in several different senses. When we hear the word prophet in our day, we are accustomed to thinking of the prophet. These words signify him who holds the prophetic office and is sustained as prophet, seer, and revelator. The priesthood offices and powers exercised by the president of the church are unique. The spiritual gift of prophecy is quite different. As we read in the book of Revelation, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 the prophet Joseph Smith relied on this script, relied on this scripture in teaching that every other man who has the testimony of Jesus is a prophet. Similarly, the apostle Paul states that he that prophesieth unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14.3 Thus, in the sense used in speaking of spiritual gifts, a prophet is one who testifies of Jesus Christ, teaches God's word, and exhorts God's people. In its scriptural sense, to prophesy means much more than to predict the future. In our day, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith declared that all members of the church should seek for the gift of prophecy, for their own guidance, which is the spirit of by which the word of the Lord is understood and his purposes made known. So it would be akin to the gift of revelation that the righteous are entitled to. Continuing other oaks, it is important for us to understand the distinction between a prophet who has the spiritual gift of prophecy and the prophet who has the prophetic office. 1 Corinthians 14, 2-22, The Gift of Tongues The apostle and others spoke with other tongues on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 4-8. On this occasion, the gift of tongues was manifest through God's servants, teaching the gospel in languages that were known to the listeners, but unknown to the speakers. See Acts 2, 5-11. Another manifestation of the gift of tongues occurs when a person is moved by the Spirit to speak in a language that is unknown to either the speaker or the hearers. This second manifestation of the gift of tongues seems to have been highly sought after by some members of the church in Corinth as supposed evidence of their person's spirituality. Paul corrected this misunderstanding as he explained that this form of the gift of tongues provides unbelievers with evidence of God's power, but not teach or edify the saints. See 1 Corinthians 14, 19, 22, and 26. To speak in an unknown tongue, and there's no one to interpret it, what use is there of it? There is no use. The main gift of tongues is being able to speak in another person's language that you may not know so well, but that that person, you are given the gift so that you can now converse with them in their own tongue. In the early years of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, some individuals were influenced by false spirits and engaged in unusual behaviors during worship including attempting to speak in unknown tongues and claiming it was done by the divine power. 
For a time, some members were deceived into believing that this was a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. The prophet Joseph Smith received inspiration, I'm sorry, inspired direction to help correct this misunderstanding. That's in Doctrine and Covenants section 50 and 52. Elder Robert D. Hales reviewed some important cautions regarding the purpose and use of the gift of tongues. We are told by prophets in this dispensation that revelation for the direction of the church will not be given through the gift of tongues. The reason for this is that it is very easy for Lucifer to falsely duplicate the gift of tongues, confuse the members of the church. Satan has the power to trick us as it pertains to some of the gifts of the Spirit. One in which is the most deceptive is the gift of tongues. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young explain the need to be cautious when considering the gift of tongues. Quoting, You may speak in tongues for your own comfort, but lay it this down for a rule that if anything is taught by the gift of tongues, it is not to be received for doctrine. Speak not in the gift of tongues without understanding it or without interpretation. The devil can speak in tongues. Good advice. This is probably one of the most misused gifts and the one Satan uses most often to deceive people. The gift of tongues is not empowered to dictate the church. All the gifts and endowments given of the Lord to members of the church are not given to control the church, but they are under the control and guidance of the priesthood and are judged of by it. Okay? Did you catch that? The gift of tongues is not empowered to dictate or guide and direct this church. That is for the first presidency and the twelve. The gift of tongue is used by missionaries to teach the gospel to the nations of the world. An ideal and proper use of tongues was shown forth on the day of Pentecost. By using this gift, the apostles were enabled to speak in their own tongue and be understood by persons of many different tongues. Acts 2, 1 through 18. Indeed, the gift of tongues by the power of the Holy Ghost in the church, as the prophet Joseph Smith said, is for the benefit of the servants of God to preach to unbelievers as on the day of Pentecost. Be not so curious about tongues, the prophet also said, that meaning Joseph Smith. Quoting, do not speak in tongues except there be an interpreter present. The ultimate design of tongues is to speak to foreigners. And if persons are very anxious to display their intelligence, let them speak to such in their own tongues. That is, in the tongues of the foreigners. The major purpose of the gift of tongues is so that you can preach the gospel to foreigners in their language. How do, why do you think missionaries are able to pick up the language so quickly? At first it is hard, but then they pick it up. It's a gift of the Spirit, the gift of tongues. Caution should always attend the use of the gift of tongues. It is not necessary, for instance, for tongues to be taught to the church particularly, for any man that has the Holy Ghost can speak of the things of God in his own tongue as well as to speak in another. For faith comes not by signs, but by hearing the word of God. Speak not in the gift of tongues without understanding it or without interpretation. The devil can speak in tongues. The adversary will come with his work. He can tempt all classes, can speak in English or Dutch. Let no one speak in tongues unless he interpret, except by the consent of the one who is placed to preside. Then he may discern or interpret, or another may. Tongues and their interpretation are given for special purposes under special circumstances. There are a host of gifts that are far more important and in the use of which is less chance for deception. 
the gifts of exhortation, of preaching, of expounding doctrine, of teaching the gospel, though not nearly so dramatic, are far greater and more value than, of value than tongues. In the church, I would rather speak five words of my understanding than by my voice I might teach also, others also, Paul averred, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, Prophecy and Charity Prophecy is greater than charity because in order to prophesy, a man must first have the pure love of Christ in his soul, which is charity. And then he must attune himself to the Holy Spirit so as to receive the spirit of revelation and prophecy. Chiefly, the gift of prophecy is known by revelation from the Holy Ghost of divine sonship of our Lord. See Revelation 19, 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 through 19 and verse 26. Let all things be done unto edifying. Paul said, let all things be done unto edifying. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul repeatedly used forms of the word edify in 1 Corinthians 14. See verses 3 through 5, 12, 17, and 26. To describe the purposes, purpose of spiritual gifts. The word edifying is a translation of the Greek, and I'm, I know I'm not going to say this right, oikodomen, which literally means the process of building a house. Paul said that the members of the church were God's building. See 1 Corinthians 3.9. Therefore, one reason we should seek for spiritual gifts is to build up or strengthen the church of God. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 46, 11 through 12. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 through 25. Verse 20, Paul is saying, Be not children who seek the showy rather than the useful. In verse 20, he is saying in the law, that is in the Old Testament, Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. As God confounded the unbelieving Jews who rejected Isaiah's plain warnings as folly by bringing upon them invaders, Assyrians, of unintelligible speak. So tongues are meant to impress unbelievers as a sign of the existence of spiritual influences. But as of old, many will be confirmed by them in their unbelief. Verse 22, Paul is saying, And what is suggested to us is that the utterances of those who have received this gift are assigned to attract the attention of unbelievers and warn them of the presence of the Spirit. Whereas, on the other hand, prophecy makes it appeal rather to believers. In verse 23, Paul is saying, But if an unbeliever comes into your assembly and hears only words uttered in an ecstasy without interpretation, Will he not suspect you all of madness? In verses 24 and 25, Paul says, Whereas if he comes in and finds you prophesying, he is likely to be impressed and converted. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 through 35, Should women keep silent in the church? It is difficult to know the intent of Paul's counsel in 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35 without knowing the actual question or the circumstances that prompted it. From Paul's teachings earlier in this same epistle, it is clear that he did not forbid women from speaking in the church meetings. See 1 Corinthians 11.5. Paul also reminded both men and women to be silent during meetings when others speak. 1 Corinthians 14, 28 and 30. Perhaps we can best understand this passage when we see that the Joseph Smith translation for 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35 replaces the word speak with rule in both verses. This would change... 
this word change suggests the possibility that Paul was trying to correct a situation in which some Corinthian women were either being disorderly during worship services or seeking to take the lead from priesthood leaders. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, women are called upon to teach, testify, exhort, and serve. But they should not upsert the authority given to priesthood leaders. Doctrine and Covenants 25, 5-7. And the History of the Church, Volume 4, page 579. The same can also be said of all male members who are not called to preside. May women speak in church? Yes, in the sense of teaching, counseling, testifying, exhorting, and the like. No, in the sense of assuming rule over church as such and attempting to give direction as, how, as to how God's affairs on earth shall be regulated. That is for priesthood authority. Those who regulate the affairs for the church is the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve for the church of the whole, and then stake presidents for their stake, and then bishops for their ward. Joseph Smith taught, a woman has no right to found or organize a church. God never sent them to do it. That's in Teachings, page 212. Paul is here telling the sisters they are subject to the priesthood. That is not their providence to rule and reign. That the bishop's wife is not the bishop. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught the following regarding men's and women's roles in the church. Quoting, let me repeat something I stated in the April 2013 General Conference. In our Heavenly Father's great priesthood-endowed plan, men have the unique responsibility to administer the priesthood, but they are not the priesthood. Men and women have different but equal valued roles. Just as women cannot conceive a child without a man, so a man cannot fully exercise the power of the priesthood to establish an eternal family without a woman. In the eternal perspective, both the procreative power and the priesthood power are shared by husband and wife. Why are men ordained to priesthood offices and not women? President Gordon B. Hinckley explained that it was the Lord, not man, who designated that men in his church should hold the priesthood and that it was also the Lord who endowed women with capabilities to round out this great and marvelous organization, which is the church and the kingdom of God. When all is said and done, the Lord has not revealed why he has organized his church as he has. Brothers and sisters, and especially sisters, who think, to upsert the power of the priesthood, and that they should be given it. And instead of arguing over who has the priesthood, which is probably offensive to our Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, maybe we should be more concerned and using the priesthood what we have to gain eternal life, and then we'll gain a greater knowledge. When thinking about those things which we do not fully understand, I am reminded of these words by my deceased friend and apostle, Elder Neil A. Maxwell, who said, What we already know about God teaches us to trust Him for what we do not know fully. And Elder Jeffrey Allholland stated in this last April General Conference, In this church, what we know will always trump what we do not. No. Again, instead of being all upset at who has the priesthood, maybe we should be more concerned about what we're using and doing with the priesthood. And are we respecting it and respecting the way God has organized his church, even though he has not given us the details? He is under no obligation 
to explain why he has organized it the way he has. It is up to us to have faith that he knows what he is doing. Finishing the quote by President Hinckley, Brothers and sisters, this matter, like many others, comes down to our faith. Do we believe that this is the Lord's church? Do we believe that he has organized it according to his purposes and wisdom? Do we believe that his wisdom far exceeds ours? Do we believe that he has organized his church in a manner that would be the greatest possible blessing to all of his children, both his sons and his daughters? Women are integral to the governance and work of the church through the service as leaders in the religious society, young women, and primary. Through their service as teachers, full-time missionaries, and temple ordinance workers, and in the home where the most important teaching in the gospel occurs. If you think that you will learn the gospel and get the exaltation by just what you learn from church, you are sorely mistaken. It must be taught more in the home. That's where the gospel and where we'll learn how to be exalted will be as if we will teach properly in the home. That was me, not from the quote. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 40. May we all prophesy. Paul the prophet, Paul the apostle, Paul the authority on doctrine and spiritual things, drawing on his own experiences and speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, now puts the capstone on the doctrine of spiritual gifts. He has spoken of these gifts, outlining, defining, exhorting. He has related spiritual gifts to charity and the eternal verities. Now he comes to the spirit-directed climax. Let the prophet speak. Ye may all profit, covet to prophesy. Remember, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when he says covet to prophesy, he is saying covet to have a testimony of Jesus the Christ and his true church. Prophecy stands supreme, the greatest of all the gifts of the spirit. Prophecy is revelation. It is testimony. It is spirit speaking to spirit. It is knowing by revelation that Jesus is the Lord, that salvation is in Christ, and that he has redeemed us by his blood. Prophecy is walking in paths of truth and righteousness. It is living and doing the will of him whom we are, and in its final and perfect form, known as the more sure word of prophecy, it consists in a man's knowing that he is sealed up into eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants 131, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 14.29, let the prophet speak. Let those speak who have the testimony of Jesus, who know of spiritual things by revelation, who have tasted the good word of God. Let those speak to whom the heavens have been opened, who can testify from personal knowledge, who have gained words of wisdom even by study and also by faith. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 118. Let those who speak can tell what God has revealed to them about his glorious gospel. For one truth revealed from heaven is worth all the sectarian notions in existence. That was from Joseph Smith. Let the others judge. While one prophet speaks, all other Others present shall give rapt attention to his words, that they, partaking of the same spirit which the speaker is endowed, may judge the testimony and doctrine to be good. Thus, quoting Doctrine and Covenants 50, verse 22, he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. Probably one of the biggest mistakes we make in this church is we think that just the speaker is to have the Spirit. No, the listener has to have the Spirit also if we're all going to be edified. Read Doctrine and Covenants section 50. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 30. 
preaching in the true church should be by revelation, and revelation is available to all, for all have the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the right to the constant companionship of the Spirit. Preachers and ministers who are not of God are identified by the fact that they teach with their learning and deny the Holy Ghost which giveth utterance. If any man speak, Peter said, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4.11 1 Corinthians 14.31 Ye may all prophesy. Who may prophesy? Who can receive revelation? To whom are visions and heavenly manifestations vouchsafed? Not to members of the Council of the Twelve only, not to bishops from state presidents only, not to just the leaders of the church, rather that God, who is no respecter of persons and who loves all his children, speaks to every person who will heed his voice. Prophecy is for all, men, women, and children, every member of the church. And those who have the testimony of Jesus have the spirit of prophecy, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 Would God, said Moses, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? That's Numbers 11.19. You see what Moses said? Even? I wish all had a testimony of Jesus, had that spirit of prophecy. However, we need to remember that when the Lord reveals to a person, if for that person is for that person and should not be shared as taught it as taught as if it applies to all church members. Your own personal revelation and prophecy is for you. 1 Corinthians 14:32 there is nothing disorganized or haphazard about meetings in the church. Members do not stand and speak at will. There are always presiding officers who conduct all meetings as they are directed and guided by the Holy Spirit. Dr. Covenants 46.2 1 Corinthians 14.33 Quoting Doctrine and Covenants 132.8, Behold, mine house is a house of order, saith the Lord, and not a house of confusion. Organize yourselves, prepare every needful thing, and establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. That is what Paul is trying to teach in 1 Corinthians 14.33. 1 Corinthians 14.37, Paul was counseling by the power of the Spirit, and it follows that any person in turn with the, with the same Spirit shall know the counsel comes from God. 1 Corinthians 13.39, covet to prophesy. What better desire can members of the church have than this? In effect, it means seek the Spirit and companionship of the Spirit is the greatest gift man can receive in this life. Think of all the things we covet, brothers and sisters, and are we coveting the gift of prophecy? That's the one he told us we should be, and it's probably the least one we're doing. Let's now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ and the victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, I deliver unto you that which I also received. Following the death of Jesus Christ and before the gospel narratives were written, the followers of Christ gathered to share stories and discuss what Jesus had taught and done during his earthly ministry. Sharing these oral accounts helped disciples remember the words and deeds of Jesus. And these accounts would have been retold often before eventually being recorded and preserved. Paul may have been referring to such information when he wrote to the Corinthian saints, I delivered unto you that which I also received, which illustrates his effort to transmit and preserve the gospel knowledge he had acquired. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 11. Paul's brief summary of the things he had received and delivered includes the doctrines that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and then rose again on the third day, and that he was seen by many eyewitnesses. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8 
The prophet Joseph Smith similarly identified these teachings as being the core of the gospel, quoting Joseph, the fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven. And all other things which pertain unto our religion are only appendages to it. The resurrection is the creation of an immortal soul. It consists in the uniting or reuniting of body and spirit in immortality. A resurrected being is one for whom body and spirit are inseparably connected in a state of incorruption, a state which there never can be decay, corruption, or death, meaning separation of the body and spirit. Resurrected beings have bodies of flesh and bones, tangible corporal bodies, bodies that occupy space, digest food, and have power outwardly to appear as mortal bodies do. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Christ died for our sins. Verses 1-2, through two, The very gospel of Jesus Christ itself is that the Lord was crucified, died, and rose again the third day in glorious immortality. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the plan of salvation. It embraces all the laws, principles, doctrines, rights, ordinances, acts, powers, authorities, and keys necessary to save and exalt men in the highest heaven to get hereafter. It is the covenant of the salvation which the Lord makes with men on earth. Literally, gospel means good tidings from good, God or good story. Thus, it is the glad tidings or good news concerning Christ, his atonement, the establishment of his earthly kingdom, and a possible future inheritance in his celestial presence. Because of the atonement, men are saved if, after baptism, they keep the commandments. That way they are saved by ordinance. See Philippians 2, 12-16. Verse 3, Christ died for our sins. The atonement redeems men from their fallen spiritual fall if they repent. D.S.T. 29, 44. Quotes, For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh, wherefore he suffereth the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he that raiseth again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. Conditions of repentance. Repentance is not unconditional. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 9, the resurrection. Much of 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul's response to those in Corinth who said that there is no resurrection of the dead. See 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Those who refuse to believe in the resurrection may have been influenced by the prevalent Greek philosophy that accepted the immortality of the spirit, but rejected the resurrection of the body. To counter this false teaching, Paul listed an impressive number of people who had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See 1 Corinthians 15, 5-8. The resurrected Savior's appearance to his half-brother James is recorded only in 1 Corinthians 15.7. President Thomas S. Monson spoke about the power of both ancient and modern eyewitness testimonies of the risen Lord. Now, before I quote him, you need to understand why this is so significant. The resurrection is the absolute proof that Jesus Christ is a God. And that's why Satan tries so hard to convince people that there's no resurrection. This is proof that Christ was God, a God. Quoting President Thomas S. Monson, Against the doubting worlds today concerning Christ's divinity, we seek a point of reference, an un unimpeachable source, even a testimony of eyewitnesses. Stephen, from biblical times, doomed to the cruel death of a martyr, looked up to heaven and cried, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, Acts 7.56, who can help 
but be convinced by the stirring testimony of Paul to the Corinthians. He declared that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And said Paul, last of all, he was seen of me. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5 and 8. In our dispensation, continuing President Monson's quote, this same testimony was spoken boldly by the prophet Joseph Smith as he and Sidney Rigdon testified. This is from Doctrine and Covenants 7622. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. This is the knowledge that sustains. This is the truth that comforts. This is the assurance that guides those who are bowed down with grief out of the shadows and into the life. End of quote. How can Paul or Peter or anyone prove that Christ rose from the dead? The fact of resurrection is a spiritual reality, one wholly outside the realm of scientific investigation or proof. It cannot be established by reason, research or reason or laboratory experiment. Spiritual truths can only be known by revelation. They are always revealed to the world by witnesses, prophets, and righteous men who have seen within the veil, who have heard the voices of beings from another sphere, and who can therefore testify of the things of God. Peter and the others felt the nail marks in the hands of the risen Lord, thrust their hands into the spear wound in his side, and ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Luke 24, Acts 10, 34-43. Could there be any better evidence than this? 1 Corinthians 15.10, Grace of God. I am what I am, that is, Paul is saying, an apostle, which was not in vain, that was, in other in other words, mean was justified by its results. His apostolic word, work, as well as his apostolic, Apostleship itself was due to the grace of God. Second Nephi 2, 7 through 8 goes along with this, saying, Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. Do you notice that none of our works is listed in there? Continuing this verse, who layeth down his life according to the flesh and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Another one going along with this, 2 Nephi 10, 24. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. I do not care how much you do in this gospel and how righteous you may think you are. That will never get you into exaltation. It will only be through the grace of Jesus Christ. And the only way we can access his grace is by having faith in Jesus Christ. And the only way we can have faith in Jesus Christ is by doing what Christ wants, when he wants it done, and how he wants it done. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. Now is Christ risen from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a crowning event of the atonement, signaling the Savior's victory over death and sin. Therefore, to those in Corinth who claimed there was no resurrection of the dead, Paul responded by explaining that if Christ had not been risen from the dead, there could be no forgiveness of sin and no hope for eternal life. President Howard W. Hunter spoke of the profound significance of the resurrection. 
quoting him, even with the logic of nature's regeneration and even with the testimony of that empty garden tomb, there are still those who feel the grave is a final destination. But the doctrine of the resurrection is the single most fundamental and crucial doctrine in the Christian religion. Paul also taught that if there were no resurrection, then we are all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Why? Because then death would be the end and we would be subject to Satan for eternity. On the other hand, when we understand the reality of the resurrection, we find greater joy, perspective, and purpose. As President Dallin H. Oates of the First Presidency taught, quote, when we understand the vital position of the resurrection of the plan of redemption that governs our journey, we see why the Apostle Paul taught, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 13-14 We also see why the Apostle Peter referred to the fact that God the Father, in his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resur resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 3 Continuing President Oaks, the lively hope we are given by the resurrection is our conviction that death is not the conclusion of our identity, but merely a necessary step in the des destined transition from mortality to immortality. This hope changes the whole perspective of mortal life. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ were foretold by Old Testament prophets. Resurrection and immortality affects how we look on the physical changes of mortality, how we live our mortal lives, and how we relate to those around us. If there's no resurrection, brothers and sisters, we would, oh, this, this mortality would be so miserable in how self-conceited and self-consumed we would be in ourselves. Continuing Iller Oaks, the assurance of resurrection gives us the strength and perspective to endure the mortal challenges faced by each of us and by those we love. Such things as the physical, mental, and emotional deficiencies which bring with us at birth or acquired during mortal life. Because of the resurrection, we know that these mortal deficiencies are only temporary. The, resur the assurance of resurrection also gives us a power incentive, powerful incentive to keep the commands of God during our mortal lives. End of quotation. Verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ was resurrected, a fact which the apostle has already shown in the only way which a spiritual reality can be proved, that is, by witnesses who saw and talked and felt and ate with the resurrected Lord, if he was resurrected, then so it is or shall be with all men. How then do some of you preach there is no resurrection? Verses 13 and 14, Paul is saying, Indeed, the fact of our Lord's resurrection and the consequent immortality thereby passed on to all men lies at the heart and core of center of Christianity. Unless Christ was resurrected, he was not the Son of God. Unless he inherited from an immortal father the power of immortality, he was as other men, incapable of bursting the bands of death for himself and for all men, thus making our preaching on your faith is in vain. The resurrection proves the divine sonship, and the divine sonship is established by the fact of resurrection. And the two are inseparably connected. Both are true, or neither is. Thus, brothers and sisters, all the importance of gaining a witness of the reality of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 through 20. Now, as Christ risen from the dead, verse 15. False witnesses. If we have testified that Christ has risen from the dead, and yet did not then, we are not merely empty talkers, but positive liars. No thoughtful skeptic 
nowadays regards apostles as impostors. Their character as well as their suffering forbids this, but he would say that they were victims of a mistake merely imagined they saw the risen Lord. But the idea of this never enters Paul's mind. It was to him perfectly impossible that they could have been mistaken. Verse 17 through 18, if Christ was not raised from the dead, your faith is vain and you are yet in your sins, not justified from them, Romans 2.25, unforgiven, unrenewed. Christ's resurrection is the seal of our justification and the creator of our sanctification. If there be no resurrection, of what avail our forgiveness and salvation? What avail is there to anything in life then? We might as well just be self-centered, looking to ourselves, eat, drink, and be merry, and not worry about another person but ourselves. What a miserable life that would be. Verse 19, Paul is saying, Moreover, true religion is not something for this life alone. It does not suffice for men to attain peace here while they're while they let eternity take care of itself. Such a limitation would leave the saints as the most miserable of all men. Rather, their hope in Christ is for a better world to come. This life is the time prepared to meet God, to inherit that eternal life made possible through our Lord's atoning sacrifice is the hope and goal of all those hearts who are set on righteousness. Neil A. Maxwell said, the Savior's second coming will thus swiftly silence the needless debate carried on by some over the so-called historic historicity of Jesus Christ. Those who view him only as a little God or as a moral teacher, having hope in Christ only in this life, will in that awful moment be of all men most miserable. Continuing Elder Maxwell, but we must not mistake about it. The deception of the world will be clever and the pull of the world real and insistent. Life in the last days will be filled with tribulation and temptation and deception and polarization so much that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. Just look at what they're doing with marriage, gender, sexuality, and all of that deception. Finishing Elder Maxwell, in such darkness, so much greater is the need for God's laws and for the light of the gospel. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light, Proverbs 6.23. Those of us seeking to progress with notwithstanding our weakness, dare not to go forward lampless. Verse 20. Paul is saying the law of Moses dictated that when the yearly crop harvest began, each farmer was to dedicate his first sheaf of grain as an offering to the Lord in acknowledgement that he is the source of all the, their blessings. Leviticus 23, 9-14 and Deuteronomy 26, 1-11. Paul drew upon the image of the fruits of the, of the first of the first fruits of the land Exodus 23, 19, as he described the resurrected Savior as the first fruits of the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23. Just as farmers' first fruits were the earliest of many crops to be harvested, Jesus Christ was the first of all beings to be resurrected, thereby opening the way for all of the inhabitants of the world to similarly be raised from the dead. Elder Joseph B. Wordland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles confirmed Paul's glorious teaching that everyone will be resurrected. Quoting Elder Wordland, When the Savior rose from the tomb, he did something no one had ever done. He did something no one else could do. He broke the bonds of death, not only for himself, but for all who have ever lived, the just and the unjust. When Christ rose from the grave, becoming the first fruits of the resurrection, he made that gift available to all. And with that sublime act, he softened the devastating, consuming sorrow that gnaws at the souls of those who've lost precious loved ones. End of quote. 
1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22, Christ and Adam. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, Christ and Adam are perfectly united in all things. Each performed the mission assigned by the eternal God. Both are spirit sons of the Father of Spirits. Both were mighty and great in pre-existence. Christ attained a state like unto God and then became the creator of all things. Adam standing next to the creator in power and dominion and then leading the armies of heaven when Lucifer and his host rebelled. Both came into the world as sons of God. Adam, coming before death, entered the world. Christ coming as the only begotten in the flesh. And no two persons ever born on earth had ministries more intimately and essentially connected. Adam coming to bring temporal and spiritual death into the world through his transgression and fall. Christ coming to bring immortality and eternal life through his righteousness and redeeming sacrifice. Adam brought the mortality, Christ immortality. Adam brought death, Christ life. Death consists in the separation of the body and the spirit and is possible only because mortality came into the world through the fall of Adam. Immortal, immortal life consists in the reuniting inseparably of body and spirit and comes because of the atonement of Christ. Without mortality, there could be no immortality. Without Adam, there could be no mortality. Without Christ, no more immortality. The mission of each is tied into one eternal plan. The plan of the Father, the plan which gives immortality to all its children and offers eternal life to them on conditions of obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Eternal life is not unconditional. On conditions of obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. End of Elder McConkie's quote. 1 Corinthians 23-28, there is an order in the resurrection. Verse 23, Paul explained that the resurrection follows an established order or sequence. See 1 Corinthians 15-23. Bruce R. Mc L. Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve, summarized the sequence in which the resurrection occurs. Order in the resurrection is determined by obedience to gospel law. The most righteous man was first, the most wicked shall be last. Christ was first, the son of perdition shall be last. End of quote. Jesus Christ was the first to be resurrected. Immediately following his resurrection, there were righteous saints who arose from the grave. Matthew 25, 52-53. At the second coming, the resurrection will continue with the coming forth of other righteous saints who are Christ's at his coming. 1 Corinthians 15.23 Through Latter-day Revelation, we learn that these people will inherit the celestial kingdom. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 50 through 70, and section 88, 97 through 98. Then will come the resurrection of those who will receive terrestrial glory. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 71 through 79, and DNC 88, 99. They will be followed at the end of the millennium by those who will inherit Telestial glory. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 81 through 86, and section 88, 100 through 101. Finally, the resurrection will be concluded with the raising of those who are filthy still, the sons of perdition, who will receive no degree of glory but will return again to their own place to enjoy that which they are willing to receive because they are not willing to enjoy that which they might have received. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 31, 39, 43 for 44. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 28 to 32, 35, 101 to 102. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, 20 to 28, the order of the resurrection, verse 24. Then cometh the end. Paul is saying, Afterward cometh the resurrection of damnation. In the forepart of this final resurrection shall come forth those inheritance in the telestial world, and in the latter part of those who as sons of perdition shall be cast out with Lucifer and his rebel hosts forever. 
And Dr. Clemens 88, 101 through 102 says, And again, another trump shall sound, which is the third trump. And then cometh the spirits of men who are to be judged and are found under condemnation. And these are the rest of the dead. And they live not again until the thousand years are ended, neither again until the end of the earth. And another trump shall sound, which is the fourth trump, saying, These are found those among those who are to remain until the last and great day, even the end, who shall remain filthy still. That would be sons of perdition. People going to the telestial kingdom have to wait until the end of the millennium. They must remain in hell to be cleaned up. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 15, if you look at the Joseph Smith translation of 1 Corinthians 15, 27, the bold is what Joseph Smith added. For he saith, when it is manifest that he hath put all things under his feet, this is Christ, and that all things are put under, he is expected of the Father who did put all things under him. So one day, all things will be under the feet of Christ. He will be above all of us and all things, just as the Father is above Christ. 1 Corinthians 20, 15, 29, Baptism for the Dead. Paul is saying, Why do you Christian saints perform baptisms for the dead who died without a knowledge of the gospel if there is no resurrected state in which they can reap the blessings of this holy ordinance? No baptisms for the dead were performed before the Savior visited the spirit world and bridged the gulf between paradise and the spirit prison. Vicarious baptisms were performed only after Jesus was resurrected. The only Bible passage that mentions vicarious baptisms for the dead is 1 Corinthians 15.29, although other ancient texts attest that baptisms for the dead was practiced by early Christians. President Howard W. Hunter explained that without the resurrection, baptism for the dead would be meaningless, quoting, Else what shall they do which are bapt for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? This is a challenging question. Why are you performing vicarious baptisms for those who are dead if there is no resurrection? History bears out the facts of the practice of baptizing for those who have died without he, without the benefit of his ordinance. Sorry for the typo. It would seem certain from the question that was asked by Paul that this vicarious practice was followed in the branch of the church in Corinth. His query is well taken. There would be no sense in such ordinance except there be a resurrection. Nothing matters if there is not a resurrection. Everything would end in darkness of death. End of quote. Isn't that horrible? Without the resurrection, everything would end in darkness of death. Jesus Christ taught that baptism is necessary to obtain eternal life. See John 3, 5. Paul himself was baptized and taught that through this important ordinance, we could walk in a newness of life. Romans 6, 4, Acts 9, 18. Yet millions of Heavenly Father's children have died without gaining a knowledge of Jesus Christ or receiving the essential ordinances of baptism. Paul's reference to baptism for the dead suggests that the early church members knew of God's plan to redeem the dead. Continuing President Hunter, Knowledge of God's plan for the redemption of the dead and the ordinance of vicarious baptism has been restored in our day. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency pointed out the critical importance of vicarious work for the dead. President Faust quoted, Because baptism by water and the Spirit is essential for salvation, in the eternal nature of things, all of God's children should have this opportunity, including those who have lived in centuries past. Doing something so vital for those who cannot do it for themselves is truly Christ-like. By laying down his life to atone for the sins of all mankind, Jesus did that for us which we cannot do for ourselves. The prophet Malachi reinforced this concept when he spoke of the coming of the prophet Elijah, who would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest the Lord come and smite the earth with a curse. This is accomplished in large measure through the vicarious work of the dead. 
End of President Hunter's quote. Regarding vicarious baptisms for the dead, Elder David a. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles offered the following invitation and promise to the young people of the church. I encourage you to study, to search out your ancestors, and to prepare yourselves to perform proxy baptisms in the house of the Lord for your kindred dead. And I urge you to help other people identify their family histories. As you respond in faith to this invitation, your heart shall turn to the fathers. The promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be implanted in your hearts. Your patriarchal blessing, which is declaration of lineage, will link you to these fathers and be more meaningful to you. Your love and gratitude for your ancestors will increase. Your testimony of and conversion to the Savior will become deep and abiding. And I promise you will be protected against the intensifying influence of the adversary. Let me repeat that. Against the intensifying influence of the adversary, you will be protected. As you participate in and love this holy work, you will be safeguarded in your youth and throughout your lives. End of quote. President Howard W. Hunter taught of the blessings that come from both reaching, researching family names and then performing the work for those individuals. Quote, doing work for others is accomplished in two steps. First, by family history research to ascertain our progenitors, and second, by performing the temple ordinances to give them the same opportunities afforded to the living. Yet there are many members of the church who have only limited access to the temples. They do the best they can. They pursue family history research and have the temple ordinances done, work done by others. Conversely, there are some members who engage in temple work but fail to do family history research on their own family lines. Although they perform a divine service in assisting others, they lose the blessing by not seeking their own kindred dead as divinely directed by latter-day prophets. I have learned that those who engage in family history research and then perform the temple ordinance for those whose names they have found will know the additional joy of receiving both halves of the blessing. End of quote. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30-34, Obedience and the Resurrection. It is the hope of a better life to come that enabled the saints to stand against the perils and enticements of the world. Well, that's going to be the same for us then, brothers and sisters. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we want to be able to withstand the enticements and perils of the world, then we need to have a hope for a better life to come. Whenever men gain the Lord's eternal perspective, or whence they came, why they are here, and what lies ahead in the eternal realms of living and being, they are better to govern the deeds done in the flesh. A knowledge of the resurrection thus leads to personal righteousness. Verses 30-32, Paul is saying, If there is no resurrection, why do the saints stand in jeopardy of their lives every hour? Why do they suffer persecution, submit to oppression, and bow down hostily, bow down before hostility and hate rather than deny the faith? See, it makes no sense. If there's no resurrection, why even admit that there's the faith in Christ? Why do they let themselves be driven from homes and lands, see their loved ones slain, and suffer death themselves rather than become one with the world. Again, sorry for the typo. It is not the rejoicing they have daily in the hope of a better resurrection, though they are called upon to die as martyrs of the truth. Joseph Smith's translation of 1 Corinthians 15.31 says, and again the bold is Joseph Smith's editing, I protest unto you the resurrection of the dead, and this is my rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus of our Lord daily, though I die. Uh, that's a major change from what just 1 Corinthians 15, 31 says. Verses 33 through 34, Therefore Paul reasons, let us keep the commandments and gain the promised blessings, even a better resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 40, Kingdoms of Glory. Our knowledge of degrees of glory and kinds of salvation is in fact an amplification and explanation of the doctrine of resurrection. 
Quoting Doctrine and Covenants 76, 16 through 20, while we were doing the work of translation which the Lord had appointed unto us, the prophet writes of himself and Sidney Rigdon, we came to the 29th verse of the 5th chapter of John, which is given unto us as follows, Speak of the resurrection of the dead concerning those who shall hear of the voice of the Son of Man, and shall come forth, they who have done good in the resurrection of the just, and they who have done evil unto the resurrection resurrection of the unjust. Now this caused us to marvel that it was given unto us of the Spirit. And while we meditate upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understandings, and they were opened, and the glory of the Lord shone round about, and we beheld the kingdoms of glory in the eternal worlds. Verse 35, How are the dead raised up? by the power of God who created them, as such is made manifest in the atoning sacrifice of his Son. Immortal, immortality comes because of Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life, without whom there would be neither immortality nor eternal life. With what body do they come? The one they are entitled to receive either a celestial, terrestrial, or telestial body, or a body incapable of abiding the glory found in any of the mansions which are prepared. That would be sons of perdition. And the degree of glory gained by each person which shall be that which is resurrection and immortal body can be. So there is a difference between a celestial, terrestrial, and telestial bodies. It will be visible. Terrestrial and telestial bodies will be incapable of having spirit children. It will not be permissible. They will not have the ability and to function in that function. It will be taken away from them because they could not be trusted with it on earth. Verse 36 to 38. Even as the seed sown in the ground decays that a new plant may live, so our mortal bodies return to the dust that they may rise again in a more glorious state. In verses 39 to 30, Paul is saying, Even as there is a difference between the flesh of men and beasts and fish and birds, so there is a difference between te celestial, terrestrial, and telestial bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 40, the kingdoms of glory. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 Corinthians 15, 40 says the following. Again, the bold being the additions. Also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial and bodies telestial. But the glory of the celestial one and the glory of the terrestrial another and the telestial another. So Joseph Smith changes it and makes the doctrine complementary to what is found in section 76. That's how Paul originally had that. Verses, verse 40, 1 Corinthians 15, and D&C 88, 14 to 33. Verse 14 says, section 88, verses 14 to 33, uh, is, is, is about verse 40 in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, Now verily I say unto you, that through the redemption which is made for you is brought to pass the resurrection from the dead. Verse 15, And the spirit and the body are the soul of man. 16, And the resurrection of the dead is the redemption of the soul. 17, And the redemption of the soul is through him that quickeneth all things. In his bosom it is decreed that the poor and the meek of the earth shall inherit it. Verse 18, Therefore it must needs be sanctified from all unrighteousness, that it may be prepared for celestial glory. Verse 19, For after it hath filled the measure of its creation, it shall be crowned with glory, even with the presence of God the Father. Verse 20, That bodies who are of celestial kingdom may possess it forever and ever. For for this intent was it made and created, and for this intent are they sanctified. That is what Paul is talking about in verse 40. Continuing with section 88, 14 through 21, verse 21. And they who are not sanctified through the law which I have given unto you, even the law of Christ, must inherit another kingdom, even that of a terrestrial kingdom or that of a telestial kingdom. 22. For they who are, is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. 
23, and he who cannot abide the law of a terrestrial kingdom cannot abide a terrestrial glory. 24, and who, he who cannot abide the law of a telestial kingdom cannot abide a telestial glory. You need to understand that all of these are kingdoms of glory, that those who go to any of those kingdoms, they are cleaned up and they are sinless. But because of the work that they've done, that will determine the kingdom and the type of body that they get. But it is a kingdom of glory. Verse 25, and again, barely I say unto you, the earth abideth the law of a celestial kingdom, for it, filth, for it filleth the measure of its creation, and transgresseth not the law. 26, wherefore it shall be sanctified, yea, notwithstanding it shall die, it shall be quickened again, and it shall abide the power by which it is quickened, and the righteous shall inherit it. 27, for notwithstanding they die, they shall also rise again a spiritual body. Since the earth will become a celestial kingdom, you must have a celestial body to remain here upon it. Verses 40 uh, of 1 Corinthians 15 and Dr. Corinthians 88, 14 to 33 continued. Verse 28, they who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same body, which was a natural body, even ye shall receive your bodies, and your glory shall be the glory by which your bodies are quickened. Do you catch that? A natural body. A body that has the ability to create spiritual children. Verse 29. Yea, ye who are quickened by a portion of the celestial glory shall then receive the same, even a fullness. 30. They who are quickened by a portion of the terrestrial glory shall be, then receive of the same, even of a fullness. Verse 31. And also they who are quickened by a portion of the telestial glory shall then receive the same, even a fullness. 32. And they who shall remain shall also be quickened. Nevertheless, they shall return again to their own place to enjoy which they are willing to receive because they are not willing to enjoy that which they might have received. These are sons of perdition. 33, for what doth it profit a man if a gift is bestowed upon him, and he receive not the gift? Behold, he rejoiceth not in that which is given unto him, neither rejoiceth in him who is the giver of the gift. Those sons of perdition do not enjoy the gift of eternal life, nor the person that is willing to give it to him, that is Jesus Christ. President Joel Finley Smith explained that there will be great differences in the glory found among resurrected body deeds. Quote, in the resurrection, there will be different kinds of bodies. They will not all be alike. The body a man receives will determine his place hereafter. There will be celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies, telestial bodies, and these bodies will differ as distinctly as do bodies here. Some will gain celestial bodies with all the power of exaltation and eternal increase. That means eternal families, children. These bodies will shine like the sun as our Savior does, as described by John, Revelation 1, 12 through 18. Those who enter the terrestrial kingdom will have terrestrial bodies, and they will not shine like the sun, but they will be more glorious than the bodies of those who receive the telestial glory. End of quote. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 54, a spiritual body. Verse 42, corruption. Paul is saying mortality. Status of mortal bodies, subject as they are to physical change and decay. Incorruption, immortality. Status of physical perfect enjoyment of immortal beings, a status without death. As Amulek said, quoting Amal 1145, this mortal body is raised to an immortal body. That is from death, even from the first death unto life, that they can die no more. Their spirits uniting their bodies, never to be divided, thus the whole becoming spiritually immortal, that they can no more see corruption. Verse 44, Paul contrasts the natural body that is buried at death and the spiritual body that is raised up in the resurrection. He used the word corruption and dishonor and weakness to describe natural or mortal bodies and the words corruption and glory and power to describe spiritual 
or resurrected bodies. I'm sorry, incorruption, that should have been. President Howard W. Hunter clarified that when Paul referred to a spiritual body, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, he was speaking of a resurrected body and not a spirit. There is a separation of the spirit and the body at the time of death. The resurrection will again unite the spirit with the body, and the body becomes a spiritual body, one of flesh and bones, but quickened by the spirit instead of blood. You have a body of flesh and bones that you can touch. There is just not blood running through your veins. There is spirit running through your veins. Finishing the quote, Thus our bodies, after the resurrection, quickened by the Spirit, shall become immortal and never die. This is the meaning of the statement of Paul that there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, and that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The natural body is flesh and blood, but quickened by the Spirit instead of blood. It can and will enter into the kingdom. So there will be a change of what flows through our veins. Verse 45, Paul is saying, Adam, the first man, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, was the first to receive a physical body. Jesus Christ, the last Adam, or second man, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, 47, was the first to be quickened, meaning resurrected, and receive a glorified body. See John 5, 21. The actions of Adam with the fall and Jesus Christ with the atonement and resurrection were both necessary for our salvation. Verse 47, Paul is teaching, Of the earth, earthly, hence subject to decay and death, Genesis 3.19, out of it, meaning the ground, was thou taken. For dust thou art, and to dust thou return, from heaven, and so spiritual and eternal. Verse 49, Paul saying, have, We have borne the image that is, have been made like. Our present body is like Adam's, but it will be conformed to the body of Christ's glory, image of the heavenly. Philippians 3, 21. Verse 50, President Russell M. Nelson taught, An infinite atonement was required to redeem Adam and Eve and all their posterity. The atonement must enable our physical bodies to be resurrected and changed. See 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. To a, bone, a bloodless form no longer liable to the disease, deterioration, or death. Do you catch that? It's because of our blood that we have death and disease and we grow old. That was the end of the quotation. The phrase flesh and blood in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 refers to mortal bodies, which is subject to aging and corruption. Since the mortal body will not live forever, it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The immortal body of flesh and bones received in the resurrection will be glorified and will not deteriorate because it has spirit running through its veins. The life of the mortal body is in the blood. See Leviticus 17.11. Joseph Smith taught that when our flesh is quickened by the spirit, there will be no blood in the tabernacle, meaning in our body. Verse 51 through 52. Quoting Doctrine and Covenants, section 63, 50 through 51, And he that liveth, when the Lord shall come and keep the faith, blessed is he. Nevertheless, it is appointed to him to die at the age of a man. Wherefore, children shall grow up until they become old. Old men shall die, but they shall not sleep in the dust, but they shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 54, A Spiritual Body Continued. Verse 54, President Diedrich F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency taught, One day we will take that unavoidable step and cross from this mortal sphere into the next estate. One day we shall look back at our lives and wonder if we could have been better, made better decisions, or used our time more wisely. It is my testimony that many of the deepest regrets of tomorrow can be prevented by following the Savior today. If we have sinned or made mistakes, if we had made choices that we now regret, there is the precious gift of Christ's atonement, through which we can be forgiven. We cannot go back in time and change the past, but we can repent. 
the Savior can wipe, wipe away our tears of regret. See Revelation 7, 17. And remove the burden of our sins. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. His atonement allows us to leave the past behind and move forward with clean hands, a pure heart, and a determination to do better, especially to become better. Yes, this life is passing swiftly. Our days seem to fade quickly and death appears frightening at times. Nevertheless, our spirits will continue to live and will one day be united with our resurrected body to receive immortality. I bear solemn witness that because of the merciful Christ, we will all live again forever. Because of our Savior and Redeemer, one day we will truly understand and rejoice in the meaning of the words, the sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. End of quote. Jesus Christ can remove the sting of death for those, for, for those who lose loved ones, as President Russell M. Nelson explained. When death comes, we can move towards celestial glory that Heavenly Father has prepared for his faithful children. Meanwhile, for sorrowing loved ones left behind, the sting of death is soothed by a steadfast faith in Christ, a perfect brightness of hope, a love of God and of all men, and a deep desire to serve themselves. 2 Nephi 31.20 That faith, that hope, that love will qualify us to come into God's holy presence and with our eternal companions and family dwell with them forever. End of quote. This goes along with what Elder Bednar once said to a young man who had cancer, do you have enough faith to die? Sometimes, brothers and sisters, it is our lot in life to die at a certain time. Do you have enough faith in Christ to die? Of course he can cure us from any disease, from any ailment, from any affliction. The New Testament is proof of that. That he can do it is not the question. The question is, is it his will to do it? And if it's not, do you have enough faith to die and still put your faith in him if it's your time to go? 1 Corinthians 15, 55-58, The Sting of Death. Why teach the doctrine of the resurrection? As with all doctrine, a knowledge of it encourages men to live better lives. Their mere fact of resurrection, the reality that all shall rise from the dead, this standing alone sheds a flood of light and hope upon all who know it. But the detailed doctrine, the doctrine that there are times and kinds of resurrection, that some men shall come forth into the resurrection of life, Others in the resurrection of damnation, that some shall be raised with celestial bodies, and others into eternal rest, while others shall remain filthy still. The fact that the righteous shall have righteousness restored to them, and the carnal, carnality, those who overcome the world shall have glory added upon their heads forever, while those who eat with the glutton, drink with the drunker, drunken, and are merry with the unclean shall rise to a telestial inheritance. All this stands as a great incentive to the saints to keep the commandments. Thus, an imperative to gain a witness of all of this. Hence, Paul, having taught this doctrine, comes now to the conclusion of the whole matter. The sting of death is sin. Therefore, walk as becometh saints. Let's finish our last chapter, 1 Corinthians 16, Stand Fast in Faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 1-3, Temporal Assistance for the Church in Jerusalem. Paul instructed the saints in Corinth that when they met each Sunday, they should collect donations to be sent to the church in Jerusalem. We learn from Romans 15, 25-28 that the saints in Achaia, a region that included Corinth, gladly made donations out of gratitude for the spiritual strength they received from the church in Jerusalem. By asking for their donations, Paul encouraged the Gentile saints to assist and identify with their fellow Jewish saints. This is another example of Paul's continued effort to build unity between the Jewish and Gentile members of the church. 1 Corinthians 16, 5-20 5. I pass through Macedonia, meaning, this is my present intention. His original plan had meant to go to Corinth only for a passing visit. Verse 6. Yea, and winter, or even winter. He stayed three months in Greece, when at length he carried out his plan. 8. 
Verse 8, Pentecost, one of the three great Jewish feasts associated with Christianity with the descent of the Holy Spirit. 9, a great door and effectual door is open, meaning I have good openings and must make full use of them. There must be things opening places he could go. The Spirit was opening up where he could go and, and do the work. Verse 10, if Timothy has come, Paul is saying it is not quite certain whether or not he reached Corinth. He was young and seemed to have been timid. Verse 11, though he was young, they should not despise him. Verse 12, Apollos, perhaps the Corinthian saints, had asked that he might visit them. His refusal may have arisen from fear of rekindling the party feeling at Corinth. Uh, some hard feelings maybe that were there at Corinth. Verses 13 and 14, Paul is saying these verses sum up the practical teachings of the epistle. They needed to avoid carelessness, ficklessness, the moral feeblessness, and to cultivate a spirit of Christ of love. Verse 15, Paul says, The house of Stephanaeus, baptized by the apostle himself and the first fruits of Achaia. They were converts at Athens, therefore Achaia must be used in the narrow sense of southern Greece, or else there were the first fruits of a household, addicted themselves to the ministry, meaning having set themselves to minister. Verse 16, Paul's saying, Submit yourselves unto such. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Verse 7, Stephanus and Fortunus and Archaeus, who had probably brought the letter from the Corinthians, that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. They is, they've, their visit has made up for your absence. Verse 18, Paul says, For you will be glad to hear of my gladness. Verse 19, Asia, that is, the Roman province of which Ephesus was the capital. The western part of Asia Minor or Turkey is Asia. Aquila and Priscilla, the church that is in their house, mean those Christians who assembled there. 20 says with an holy kiss, they should agree, Crete. The JST change for verse 20 says, a change of an holy kiss to give everyone a holy salutation. Joseph changed that too. Verse 27 with mine own hand, meaning this signature of authenticity. Auth authenticates the letter which was written by a secretary, perhaps Sosithianus. 1 Corinthians 16, 20-24, Paul's closing words. Paul continued his epistle to the saints in Corinth with a customary farewell which he himself wrote rather than his scribes. Paul's farewell here is usually be is here usually because before he gave his customary blessing farewell, he pronounced a curse on those who do not love the Lord. See 1 Corinthians 16, Perhaps Paul's warning and curse were directed at the saints in Corinth who were creating problems and dissensions in the church. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained the phrase, Anathemia Maranatha, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Anathemia, Anathemia is a Greek word meaning the curse, hence a person or a thing cursed by God or his authority, as for instance, one who has been excommunicated is anathemia, Romans 9.3. Woe unto them who are cut off from my church, for they, for the same are overcome of the world, the NC 58. Paul's statement, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathemia, Maranatha probably means let him be accursed until the Lord comes. Maranathara, an Aramaic word meaning, O our Lord come, appears to have been, O, o our Lord come, appears to have been used by the primitive saints as a watchword or salutation by which they reminded each other of the promised second coming. Brothers and sisters, May we gain a witness of the Holy Ghost, of the resurrection, how vital it is. That if we don't truly believe there's a resurrection, we truly won't believe in the gospel. Our, 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 our gospel belief will be vain. It, it, it won't be true. It can't be true. May we learn to prophesy and have the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of Jesus. And may we 
use that to testify of Christ. And may we fulfill our roles that he has given us as men and women of the church and trust him that he gave them to us for a reason instead of arguing over the roles that he has given us. I think that would be more pleasing unto him. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.